Well, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar with Dr Tim Nuttall, which is sponsored by Avacta Animal Health and ALK. Now, firstly, I'd just like to provide you with some information about our sponsors. Avacta Animal Health is a UK-based veterinary laboratory providing innovative products and services to veterinary practices worldwide. Their leading sensor test laboratory service provides UK manufactured food, environmental and secondary infection tests for companion animals and they have over 13 years experience in the allergy market. Avacta Animal Health also supply a range of therapies such as allergen specific immunotherapy and Staphylococcus phage lysate. You can find out more information on their products and services at www.avactaanimalhealth.com. Now ALK is a pharmaceutical company based in Denmark which is focused on allergy and provides products for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of allergies. They are the world leader in allergy vaccines, having a market share of around a third of the world market. ALK acquired R2 Biologicals in 2010, which have over 20 years experience in veterinary atopic dermatitis diagnosis and treatment, and distribute uh, veterinary allergy vaccines all over Europe. Okay, well, I'm now delighted to welcome back our speaker for this evening, Dr. Tim Nuttall. Uh, Tim is an RCVS specialist in veterinary dermatology, a uh, senior lecturer in veterinary dermatology at the University of Liverpool and head of veterinary education. So thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'm now going to hand... Thank you very much, Alison, for that kind invitation. Um, if you hear, hear me slurping something in the background, um, it's a cup of tea. I've just developed an allergy to something in my office I think and I've had the most um, uh, awful coughing and sneezing fit so I'm trying to uh, keep the tea going to keep the voice going. Um, thank you very much for giving up uh, this evening to uh, to listen to the webinar um, or whatever time of day it is wherever you are. Um, I'm aiming this really at the a practitioner who perhaps doesn't have a lot of experience of allergen specific immunotherapy um, but is aware of it and, and wants to uh, use it more and get better results uh, in practice. Um, but if there are any uh, technical questions or more in-depth things that you would like to know, if you type the questions to Alison and then um, she'll collate these and then we'll try and go through as many as we can um, right at the end of the seminar. Um, now, allergen-specific immunotherapy is probably my treatment of choice um, for long-term management of atopic dermatitis in dogs. And this was borne out in the recent uh, International Committee for Atopic Diseases in Animals uh, 2010 guidelines um, for treatment of canine atopic dermatitis, where it was specifically recommended to ameliorate the flares following re-exposure to allergens. And it is in fact the, the only really effective anti-allergy treatment um, that we have as distinct from uh, antimicrobial treatments or skin barrier care and anti-inflammatory treatments. And all of those are important in the holistic management of atopic cases and I'll, I'll go through why that's important later on. Um, but for now, I just want you to remember that um, immunotherapy is the only way to abolish ongoing allergic reactions and therefore it plays a very important part in the um, long-term management of, of, of canine atopics. Now we also um, uh, use immunotherapy in cats and horses to treat, uh, I, I guess, what we would probably call presumed allergic skin disease because the evidence um, for the role that allergic skin disease plays in these species is not uh, as well understood um, and the efficacy uh, in cats and horses is not as well understood um, but it also seems to be effective uh, in those species and it is something that we use following allergy testing as well. Um, now again like a lot of um, immunomodulating therapies uh, and I, I, go, I would include prophylactic vaccines in here, it's the immunological uh, interface between the vaccine and the animal's immune system that leads to the response and this is not really a dose dependent response unlike a, a drug which is having a pharmacokinetic uh, action within the body um, and we tend to use fairly arbitrary doses but um, certainly for large animals we, we, we're using a fairly moderate dose 
Um, and because the, the cost of the vaccine is fairly fixed, um, although it's cost effective for many animals, and in, in particular for horses uh, and, and uh, medium to large dogs, this becomes a very cost effective form of treatment um, compared to some of the more expensive anti-inflammatory drugs that are available, for example. Now, an area that um, I use immunotherapy occasionally is in respiratory disease. And although the majority, uh, the vast majority of the evidence for the use of immunotherapy um, is in uh, atopic dermatitis, so allergic skin disease, we do see some cases of presumed allergic rhinitis and very occasionally presumed allergic asthma in dogs uh, and cats and possibly horses as well. And provided one has been very careful with the diagnosis um, and uh, the uh, clinical findings, um, cytology and perhaps histopathology are consistent with an allergic response um, and other diagnoses have been ruled out. In um, animals that uh, uh, have a positive allergy test, some of those do improve respiratory function following immunotherapy. And the Samoyed you can see there is a dog that um, called Sam that I saw when I was uh, uh, newly appointed at Liverpool. And he had allergic rhinitis, or presumed allergic rhinitis, and did very, very well on immunotherapy. And he was put to sleep a couple of years ago with, for an uh, unrelated, um, uh, unrelated disease. But um, his respiratory signs were his rhinitis, which was quite severe and debilitating, was well controlled on immunotherapy. So provided you're careful with the diagnosis, respiratory disease can be another area um, that we can use this in. <laughs> Now, allergen-specific immunotherapy is a fairly crude form of treatment because, in, in essence, what we do is take the things that the animal is allergic to, um, mix them all up together, and then administer them to the animal um, in gradually increasing amounts, um, either to a fixed maximum or to the point where we start to see um, a uh, um, an adverse response in terms of increased pruritus, um, urticaria, things like that. And the idea is that we're trying to alleviate their clinical signs by uh, inducing um, tolerance. Now, the we use the term vaccine, and this I think sometimes confuses owners because they tend to interpret a vaccine as in a prophylactic uh, vaccine where we're trying to boost the immune system um, towards a pathogen. Um, whereas with immunotherapy, what we're actually trying to do is um, alter the immune system. Now, this may be more complex than turning the immune system off, but we're trying to switch the immune system to um, to being tolerant of the allergens that they're exposed to. So we minimize reactions um, uh, to these allergens when, when uh, the animal's exposed to them in, in, in the future. And this is normally at the moment given by subcutaneous injections of these crude um, allergen mixtures, but uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll go through some new and exciting work that's being done which may change this uh, in the future. Now, the really important thing to remember, and I will mentioned this several times during the webinar, is that immunotherapy needs to be specific. There is ample evidence that non-specific immunotherapy is not nearly as effective. Um, and therefore, it, the allergens have to be selected on the basis of a positive allergy test of some sort. And more than that, they must have clinical relevance to your area. You must uh, have a strong, have a reasonably strong belief or evidence that that the animal is likely to be exposed to the allergens that you're picking up, and this avoids treating animals with irrelevant allergens, um, because that does run the risk of in actually inducing a sensitivity to the irrelevant allergen. So this is um, this is a bit where you all flee the webinar room. Um, with the face with the heavyweight immunology, um, but it's really just to try and illustrate the complexity um, of, of immunotherapy and perhaps just how little we know at the moment in in veterinary allergy and, uh, and immunology and how things might improve in the future. And as far as immunotherapy is concerned, the sorry, I'm pausing because I'm trying to get an arrow to. Uh, work. There we go. 
Right, the, the key um, cell is probably this cell here, which is a T regulatory cell. And T regulatory cells, there are, there are um, at least six different types of these now uh, recognized in, um, in humans, rodents, and, and in dogs. But they um, carry certain specific markers, and they tend to produce mixtures of uh, immunomodulating cytokines, such as interleukin-10 and um, transforming growth factor beta, or TGF-beta here. And they have um, a variety of different actions. So they can alter the T helper 2, T helper 1 balance. And if you remember in um, atopic dermatitis, the T helper 2 cytokines, such as IL-4, 5, and 13, are responsible for um, selection of, uh, of B cells that produce IgE um, specific to the allergen, which then um, can cope um, mast cells. Um, and Langerhans cells and lead to uh, an ongoing allergic reaction. And IL-5 is important in the recruitment and activation of eosinophils. Whereas the T helper 1 um, cytokines, such as interferon uh, gamma and tumor necrosis factor alpha, are really important in chronic inflammation and the recruitment and activation of mononuclear cells. Now, we used to think in terms of T helper 2 was bad and T helper 1 was good, but we know that the T helper 1 cells are important in atopic dermatitis um, and that is, it is not as simple as, as, a, as a skewed T helper 2, T helper 1 balance. And the T regulatory cell seems to be really important in modulating that balance and, and inducing tolerance and inhibiting the recruitment and activation of mast cells. Uh, basophils and eosinophils, all of which are important in allergic reactions, um, and uh, decreasing um, B and T lymphocyte activation as well. And one way that immunotherapy is thought to work is that uh, in atopic dermatitis, essentially, um, there are there are lots. Sorry, there are lots of different ways that the allergen can get into the body, but the most important way is thought to be percutaneous or epicutaneous. So, a relatively low dose of allergen um, is uh, passed through the skin, where it's exposed to the epidermal Langerhans cells, and then they uh, process the allergen, uh, take it to the local lymph node, and present it to the T helper cells. Now, with immunotherapy, what we're doing is injecting a relatively high dose of allergen underneath the skin, uh, bypassing the Langerhans cells and, uh, um, and exposing uh, the allergen to these uh, dermal dendritic cells. And it's thought that by altering the dose and the dendritic or, or cell and the antigen cell presenting cell system we exposed to, um, you get uh, induction of the T regulatory cells, which then sort of knock the rest of the allergic reaction on its head. So that's that's how it, it, it is thought to work. And so this kind of explains why it's often a slow reaction, why it needs to be a specific reaction, um, why this is an immunomodulating reaction rather than an anti-inflammatory reaction, um, and why you might need to keep giving the immunotherapy, although you can get a permanent change in, in some animals, and I'll touch upon some of these points later on. Um, so I'll mention clinical allergy testing now, because I did say that this is important to identify the specific allergens that you need to include in your therapy. And it is really important that, that allergy tests are not used to confirm the diagnosis uh, of atopic dermatitis because this is a clinical diagnosis that should be made on the basis of typical clinical signs, a compatible history, and the elimination of other pyritic skin conditions. And once you've got to that point, then you can use allergy testing to identify the allergens to, for um, avoidance and specific immunotherapy. Now, I said earlier you can't use it to confirm the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. It's not quite true because strictly speaking, you can use it to confirm the difference between atopic dermatitis and atopic-like dermatitis, which is the non-allergic or apparently non-allergic form of the condition. But I think the take-home message here is the diagnosis of allergic skin disease should be made on clinical grounds, and the allergy tests are only then used to identify the allergens for further treatment. 
and these are some of the key allergen groups so this is just um, our data from Liverpool for the last few years and what I've done is divided up um, the proportion of the total positive reactions that we see and you can see that house dust mites are the most important and they make up about half of the total number of reactions that we see um, grass pollens, weed pollens and tree pollens between them probably make up about a third um, insects are uh, the next category maybe 15-20% and molds and epidermals at least in, in our area in northwest England are pretty rare um, the insects here probably masks the fact that the vast majority of those are flea reactions so flea seems to be the most important insect now that can give you a slightly skewed view because when you look in terms of the percentage of dogs with a positive test you can see that house dust mites in our population are overwhelmingly important and that where we see um, insect reactions uh, and pollen reactions they are in the majority of cases in dogs that are also allergic to house dust mites now this might vary in different parts of the world where there are different um, spectra of allergenic pollens uh, that animals are exposed to and where dogs may spend greater or lesser amounts of time indoors and depend on the local climate and environment um, but in most temperate climates this is the pattern you'll see um, perennial disease associated with house dust mites uh, is most important but you can get seasonal flares associated um, with, uh, with a variety of different pollens as well now it is important when you're looking at the um, allergy test results that you get that the allergen is um, uh, relevant to your local area so the animals are likely to be exposed to it and to, um, to be fair on the allergy test companies they they tend to do their best to try and put together regional panels that are that are relevant so up in the northwest of England um, we're probably you know Scotland most of England Wales is going to be relevant for us but what we see here may not be uh, relevant to dogs in the US it may not be relevant to dogs in uh, a Mediterranean climate where there are very different um, patterns of plants available um, so it, it is important to um, research textbooks and the internet and so on to see whether these things are relevant. There is also somewhat limited commercial availability of val validated antigens, so it is not uh, allergens, so it is not always possible to cover everything that an animal is likely to be exposed to, although the most important ones are and the key groups are. Um, you may not also be able to have exactly the same species of oak for example that um, is prevalent in your local area um, but usually there'll be um, an allergen extract from a very closely related species that probably cross reacts um, pollen info it's certainly for folk in Europe polleninfo.org is a really useful website because during the pollen season it, it gives um, uh, an update uh, every two weeks on pollen distribution and pollen counts um, actually it's more than, it's slightly less than it's three times a month um, and this can be really useful in telling you when um, certain pollens are, are around what the density is like but it's also when you're with animals on therapy um, you can direct owners to this because they can then start to anticipate um, that they're, when their uh, grass pollen allergic dog for example is likely to um, come across more allergen and perhaps have an exacerbation. Now one of the problems that we have in dogs is that the relevance of the allergens has, has strictly speaking uh, not been demonstrated for most of them. So we should um, know that the, the affected animals are exposed to the allergen. We should be able to demonstrate uh, that atopic dogs react to these allergens but healthy dogs don't. Um, and uh, 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 exposure to the allergen should exacerbate the disease and immunotherapy or avoidance should result in a specific amelioration of the disease now, unfortunately most of that's not true and the two exceptions would be um, the dermatophagoides species house dust mites where there's a lot of work being done 
uh, in uh, Europe and in the US and in Japan, um, showing the relevance of this. And we even now know some of the allergenic proteins. But I'm afraid <clears throat> the only other allergen that I'm aware of that this has been done in any detail is for Japanese cedar, which is a highly allergenic species of, um, of, of tree. It's actually unrelated to, um, to um, the, the cedar trees that we would see in Europe or North America. Um, and at, but at least three allergenic proteins um, from this plant have now been identified uh, um, and these their relevance to atopic Japanese dogs has been shown. But for many of the allergens, unfortunately, we, we do rely on um, educated guesswork. Now, this is some work that uh, we did uh, at Liverpool over the last few years. And uh, it's just been presented at the um, recent World Congress in Vancouver. And we started doing this by noticing patterns of reaction in our intradermal tests. So we would see all the house dust and storage mites coming up together and pollens. And we decided to go back through our records and do pairwise comparisons between all our different allergy test reactions and look at the odds ratios for these pairs coming up together. So we were looking for evidence of cross-reaction or co-sensitization. And the results really surprised us because you can see that within the related groups of allergens, so we, we, we divide our allergens into the, the house dust and storage mites, epidermals and fibers, insects, tree, weed, and grass pollens, and then molds. And these are all sort of phylogenetically related groups. And when we compared the allergens within a group, so this box here refers to all our comparisons of the different house dust and storage mites with each other. Um, these were very highly associated. So a dog that is positive to one house dust or storage mite is likely to be positive to at least one other. And you can see, um, looking at these blue boxes, that this was true for all our related groups. And even within the pollens, there was an association between grass pollens, weed pollens, and tree pollens. But this was not seen um, between allergens from unrelated groups. So if we compared um, dogs allergic to grass pollens with house dust and storage mites, they were more, no more likely to come up together than by chance. This has a number of implications. Um, what we don't know is whether this represents cross-reaction or co-sensitization because we didn't test that. So it could be that um, allergic dogs that come across grass pollens at the wrong time in their life um, become allergic to them all. But it could also mean um, that there are certain key cross-reacting allergens present within these groups. So when we a, a dog that is allergic to Timothy grass, for example, when we test it with perennial rye or Kentucky bluegrass, um, it is going to come up positive to those ones as well, simply because they share um, key reactive proteins. Now, the implication for that is that we could start considering the use of um, allergen mixes in diagnosis and therapy, although um, I'm a little reluctant to recommend that at the moment simply because, uh, as I said, we do, what we don't know is whether this represents independent but co-sensitization or cross-reaction and further research is required. What I would say is when you sometimes come across animals where who come up um, to a very large range of different pollens and other possibly other allergens, and this would mean making two um, or three different vaccines, I would be tempted there to use um, uh, certainly pollen mixtures um, within the tree, weed, and grass groups um, because that can bring the um, vaccine down to one vaccine, which can make a big difference of cost, which can mean the difference between going ahead with immunotherapy and not going ahead with immunotherapy. So I think a lot more work on this in the, um, uh, in, in the future, though. Um, one area where we do know cross-reaction takes place is amongst the Dermatophagoides house dust mites because um, despite um, uh, our team at Liverpool and the folks at Bristol looking very, very closely for Dermatophagoides farinae in the UK, we didn't find, find it, whereas D. terenicinus uh, is abundant. Nevertheless, um, 
positive reactions to defarinate extract are at least as common uh, in the UK as the deuteronicinus, so that must be a cross-reaction rather than a co-sensitization. Likewise, um, we know that storage mites cross-react with dermatophagoides house dust mites. They share um, certain key allergens, which are probably present in many of the uh, allergen extracts. And most dogs, to be fair, are probably not exposed to storage mites unless they are exposed to stored foods like grains, cheeses, um, or hay stables, things like that. So they are probably irrelevant to, to most dogs. Um, flea allergy testing, you need to be careful here because the, it's the flea salivary antigen that's important. And most intradermal test is pretty insensitive when it comes to that. So there are a lot of false negatives. Also, you can have flea allergic dermatitis um, which is associated with a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity, which probably won't be detected with an immediate intradermal test. Um, uh, and therefore, you mustn't use a, a positive test is great for ruling in a um, flea allergic dermatitis and uh, reinforcing the importance of flea control to an owner. But a negative test, you mustn't um, use that to rule it out. Um, other insects are of questionable relevance and probably represent cross-reaction. The only exception to that, I would say, is mosquito, um, where we see a, a, def a defined mosquito bite hypersensitivity both in dogs and in cats. Um, we get a lot here because we have a lot of so um, salt marsh locally. So this is quite a common presentation in the summer uh, for us. But you can see um, from this dog here that the clinical presentation of these eosinophilic granulomas in mosquito bite hypersensitivity is very, very different from um, atopic dermatitis. Now, um, if an animal is a, uh, has a clinically relevant pollen allergy, um, it ought to show a seasonal exacerbation that corresponds with the appropriate pollen season. Um, animals that really don't show um, a seasonal pattern of exacerbation, one has to question the, 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 the relevance of the, of, of the pollen. Now, the other thing is that po different, uh, uh, some pollens are wind pollinated and some are uh, insect pollinated. Now, basically, um, most, tr most trees and grasses are wind pollinated, so the pollen will blow about a long distance and it can travel for uh, quite miles or kilometers, quite a considerable distance. Um, and even within a city um, or an industrial estate, people can be exposed to grass and tree pollen. Flowering plants are a little bit different because their pollen is, is designed to be transported about by insects. So it's very large, relatively speaking, and very sticky. So in, a, in, in essence, you have to be able to see the plant um, to be exposed to its pollen. So that can tell you a little bit about the relevance of different plants and trees that people might note within their environment. Um, molds, um, rare, we rarely see them in the UK. They are more common elsewhere. There is some suspicion that some of the extracts might be irritant um, uh, used at the present concentrations. Um, and it probably depends on local environmental factors. And they do like, um, uh, molds do prefer high humidity. Um, some you get uh, prefer high temperature as well. Uh, in the UK, we sort of get these sort of humid um, autumns with a lot of fog and mist and relatively mild conditions. And that tends to favor Aspergillus, for, for example. There is some evidence that um, the Mold uh, proteases remain active in vitro um, and may degrade other um, allergens within immunotherapy mixtures, uh, most importantly, uh, pollen allergens. And so a lot of dermatologists actually, if they have mold uh, allergens, will, will, will put that into a separate tube and administer it as a separate injection for immunotherapy to avoid that, um, that problem. Um, there is a lot of uh, immune, uh, allergy testing going on for malassezia and staphylococci at the moment. Um, I'm 
hesitant to recommend it because we don't really know what the clinical relevance of, of, uh, of these are. Now I think um, there is plenty of evidence that a subset of atopic dogs develop a hypersensitivity to their own malassezia yeast and this is just a graph from uh, my residency project so it has a lot of um, emotional attachment for me but I have to be fair Dan Morris and Ross Bond um, have actually done most of the work in in this and by looking at uh, intradermal testing passive transfer tests and serology we've all shown that this exists there is a suspicion um, that dogs that are allergic to their malassezia do mount an inflammatory reaction to this and this might result in a particularly severe um, variant of atopic dermatitis but that's not yet been proven for sure and there is anecdotal evidence that intensive topical or systemic anti-malassezia treatment can improve those dogs um, but no to my knowledge no controlled trials have yet been done um, and the efficacy of immunotherapy using um, uh, 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 malassezia is still unknown and again, we don't know whether uh, their proteases, again, like the moulds, may be active and actually degrade other allergens within mixtures. So that's not something I'd recommend at the moment. Uh, Staphylococci, um, I've just been doing some work with Avacta, and, and we, we've we just uh, presented some work showing that um, there is a higher frequency of IgE to Staphylococci in atopic dogs than to uh, non-atopic dogs with pyoderma or control dogs. Now this may suggest again a subset of atopic dogs develop a hypersensitivity towards their staphylococci but that is in the very early stages and, and again we're not entirely sure of the clinical relevance of this so again I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend testing or immunotherapy with these at the moment. I alluded to this um, already um, in terms of using single or allergen mixes. Now one of the problems if you use uh, an allergen mix is if, if there's insufficient concentration of the relevant allergens or allergenic proteins you can have false negative results or a poor response to immunotherapy. Um, but it, uh, And if the concentration of the mix is increased to ensure that each individual allergen is present in a sufficient concentration the overall result of the mixture could then be irritant and you could get false positive um, results um, and at the moment we uh, uh, dermatophagoides um, and Japanese cedar aside we really know very little about the potential for cross reactivity um, between different allergens although this is likely to occur between related groups as I showed you in the in the table earlier so I, th I think this is an area for further research and it may be that we start to recommend either key cross-reacting allergens so we use maybe one or two key grasses instead of the full panel uh, of six or eight grasses um, or we can with confidence recommend the use of mixes but I think at the moment I would fall down on the side of saying in the absence of better data single allergens would be preferred um, except where the number of allergens was going to be a deal breaker and then I think I would be prepared to put related uh, allergens together in mixes to um, reduce the total number of, of, of vaccines and the, the, the uh, cost and difficulty of doing the immunotherapy. So I'm going to talk briefly about allergen avoidance. Now, in an ideal world, allergen avoidance would be the perfect way to treat an allergy. You're allergic to something, you just avoid it. Unfortunately, in the real world, um, the majority of environmental allergens that the animal, our animals are sensitized to are pretty ubiquitous. And although reduction of exposure is possible, it may not be feasible, realistic. Or feasible for the owners the owners to do now we we did some work this is um, uh, some work that Eleanor Raffan did with me a few years ago looking we were actually looking at um, der P1 and der F1 which are protein markers for uh, dermatophagoides pteranicinus and dermatophagoides farinae and as a side 
effect from um, that research, we discovered that owners that used environmental flea sprays had significantly reduced amounts um, of DERP1 and by extension house dust mite protein uh, in, uh, in their living rooms. And uh, there is a permethrin um, pyroproxifrin spray called Indurex, which is now actually licensed for the treatment of, of house dust mites because it kills them and inhibits their development as well. Um, we also found that owners that washed their dog beds um, more frequently than once a month, uh, they carried significantly less DERP1 and by extension house dust mite proteins relevant to dogs um, than dog beds which were washed less than once a month or never washed. Um, so that's all well and good, but the oops, um, the evidence um, that this is of any clinical benefit um, is pretty thin. And this is, to my knowledge, the only study that's been published in, um, uh, in, in the veterinary field. Um, and the uh, benzoyl benzoate is an anti-house dust mite uh, preparation that's used for human asthmatics. And although on the face of it, there seemed to be a, a good response in this trial, one of the big problems is it was an open study and there was no control group. And we know that um, the placebo effect is proportionate to how interventional a study is. And using environmental avoidance measures is very interventional. So there was likely to be a high placebo effect with this. And to my knowledge, it's never been replicated. So we um, we give out recommendation on allergen avoidance, but we are careful to say to the owners, there is limited evidence for the clinical benefit of this, and we let them do as much or as little as they're, as, as, as they're comfortable with or they have the resources to do. Anecdotally, using um, uh, environmental flea sprays, keeping dogs out of bedrooms, washing dog beds, uh, removing carpets, uh, using vacuum cleaners with um, HEPA filters do help some individuals, but then there are other individuals that, that, are, that are not helped. And it probably just depends on how far you can reduce the house dust mite protein within the environment and how allergic the animal is. So um, of, of limited benefit. I'll go back to this slide, which I've got, as I realize, I've got slightly in the, in, in the wrong order. Um, but there has been some interest in the house dust mite contamination of stored pet food. And uh, there are recommendations about keeping um, pet uh, dry foods um, in freezers and things like this. And this is, some, this is some work that we did about a year ago. And we looked at storing uh, a dry food. This was a Hills dry food in um, different uh, um, um, uh, storage means so a paper bag, the original plastic bag, and a sealable plastic box. Um, and really, we saw very little accumulation of house dust mite protein. So we saw a bit, but this was in nanogram um, per gram of house house dust range, so very very low levels. And when we, after three months, when we actually sampled the carpet next to where the food was being stored, the levels were several thousand fold higher. So. Um, we would kind of recommend that perhaps owners keep it in in a plastic box, that food in a plastic box or a plastic bag, um, and and change it after three months, and don't allow lots of accumulate, you know, clean the, the the storage container, don't allow lots of residue to build up. But to be honest, it, it, in the results of this study would indicate that the exposure in the carpet next to where the food is kept is thousands of fold higher than in the food itself. So house dust mites in food, in, in our experience, is probably not um, uh, not that important. It may differ in different parts of the world. So again, there's one study from Spain showing that um, house dust mites did contaminate dry food. OK, moving on to sort of immunotherapy proper. Um, and I hope you'll have bared born with me going through that because I think you just can't talk about immunotherapy you have to talk about it in the context of the treatment of the of the whole animal and, and everything that goes around that now there are two um, forms of vaccine that can be given um, more or less there's a, a, a phosphate gel form that I think is available in North America as well but I have no experience of using that form 
But in Europe, we can use aqueous vaccines or allen precipitated vaccines. Um, there is uh, important to say that there is no proven difference in efficacy or safety between the two types of, of uh, allergen. Um, by preference, I use aqueous vaccines, and this is for two reasons. One is um, it was what I was brought up on when I was a resident, and it's what I've always used ever since. So it's, it's something I'm very, very familiar with. And familiarity with your protocols is very important in efficacy. The second reason is um, that allen precipitated allergens uh, are, uh, have been used, used to induce allergies in experimental situations, although there's no evidence of, the, of that happening in clinical situations. Um, Alum adjuvants have also been implicated in vaccine-induced sarcomas when combined with prophylactic vaccines in cats, but there's no evidence of that occurring in, um, uh, in treating atopic animals that I'm aware of. The advantage of the alum precipitated um, vaccines is that the, the interval between injections can be longer because there is a, a depot effect, whereas with the aqueous vaccines, the, the, uh, the injections have to be given more frequently. Um, it's difficult to talk about protocols because um, if you put five dermatologists in a room, you'll get five slightly different protocols. Um, and there's really very little um, consensus on uh, what is the right one to do. And everybody's very wedded to their own one that works for them. Um, there is no evidence that any one particular protocol appears to be um, superior over the others, but then there are very few um, studies comparing different protocols. And in fact, most of the allergen-specific immunotherapy studies that have been done have all been retrospectives or non-controlled and proactive studies. But I'll go back to saying that, again, I think rather than worrying overly about the protocol, uh, I would worry about making sure that you include the right allergens. And this goes back to making sure that the, the, the selection of the allergen panel was correct for the test and that the allergens you select from the positive reactions are relevant to the individual's exposure and pattern of disease. Beyond then, it actually, I think, becomes important to, to treat each animal as an individual and don't slavishly stick to the protocol um, uh, that you've been given. Because if you cast your mind back to the immunology slide that I showed you, um, immunotherapy is fantastically complicated in the way that we think it works. And it, invo it involves a lot of um, interaction between different cells and arms of the immune systems and cytokine profiles and so on. So it's perhaps not surprising um, that some dogs may do better with a low dose given more frequently, but the next dog requires a higher dose given less frequently. Um, because we're not looking at a sort of single um, drug dose effect here. Um, it, it, is a, it is an immunomodulatory system on a very complicated um, skin inflammatory and immune system. And I think you need to tailor the protocol to the individual response. Now, basically, what you tend to do is start with a low dose and gradually increase that dose um, either to a fixed maximum or up to the point where the animal starts to show clinical signs. And this is usually manifest by pruritus immediately after the injection. And then the dose is just backed off a bit to the last dose that was well tolerated. Um, and then the, the pattern of pruritus can also help you in determining the optimum frequency because if you've increased the interval between injections a bit too far, what you'll notice is often a little um, relapse of pruritus before the next injection is due. And what you can do is just bring the, um, the frequency back to where that is controlled. And what you're doing is looking for the optimum dose and the optimum um, frequency that keeps that animal under control most of the time. Now, one thing to watch for, um, and this is a bit anecdotal, but this is something I've noted and other people have as well, is that the frequency um, with which the animal requires uh, immunotherapy may vary over the year. Now, this may vary with 
uh, other environmental factors such as uh, heat, humidity, uh, and so on. But it, um, commonly we find that this varies with pollen reactions. So our dogs which are allergic to pollens require more frequent therapy during their pollen season than they do during the rest of the year. So you need to be very alert to any changes in the dog's pattern of disease um, and regard immunotherapy as a dynamic uh, uh, treatment um, um, where in particular the frequency may need changing for long-term control. Um, the other thing is to use immunotherapy sensibly and realistically. These two dogs are not going to get better with immunotherapy. Um, you could probably um, fill these dogs uh, with as much immunotherapy as you, as you like and they are going to be just as itchy and just as inflamed at the end of that protocol as when you started. And this is because they have chronic atopic dermatitis. They have a lot of chronic ongoing inflammation within their skin. They've got um, a, a lot of cell-mediated inflammation. They'll have a lot of self-trauma, um, a lot of uh, secondary infection going on. And there is plenty to keep that inflammatory reaction ticking over. Um, and it almost becomes a sort of um, self-perpetuating immune response. Uh, without an allergy in there. So you need to use um, skin barrier care and anti-inflammatory treatments to get these dogs under control and regard the immunotherapy as a long-term thing to prevent flares associated with allergen exposure. Um, and I'll just briefly, uh, you know, some pr probably looking down the, the list here, many of you know this already, but you can look upon canine atopic dermatitis as a disease with three main abnormalities, and these are an impaired skin barrier, an allergy, and an overreactive skin immune system. And then you can have secondary skin and ear infections on top of that and, and, and so on. And you have to put together a treatment protocol for each individual dog that will manage all these areas. Um, it is relatively uncommon that immunotherapy will work by itself because um, with immunotherapy, you're only matching the allergy here. Um, and we know that there is an individual response to immunotherapy. Some dogs respond really well. Some dogs respond moderately well. Some dogs don't respond at all. And we know that uh, canine atopic dermatitis is genetically quite a varied disease. And so in the future, um, it may become apparent that in some dogs, actually, it's the skin barrier that is the crucial um, part of the disease and where we need to target our therapy and in other dogs it's an allergy and in other dogs actually it's probably uh, um, a problem with the skin immune system um, but at the moment we don't know that so it's important to, to don't over rely on immunotherapy and integrate it as an anti-allergy treatment but not an anti-inflammatory treatment and this is, again, just to, just to reinforce that by showing you how some of the allergic diseases overlap. So I've deliberately not overlapped atopic dermatitis at the top and atopic-like dermatitis at the bottom um, because we can differentiate these two diseases. Um, these are allergen negative. These are positive to environmental allergens. Now, whether they are strictly two diseases or they're subtle variants of the same disease, or these dogs are allergic to things that we don't test for is unknown, but for the moment we're, we're considering them separate diseases. But within that, you can see animals that are flea allergic, you can also see animals that are, that are food allergic. And in my experience, although the Venn diagram doesn't quite show this, actually the majority of animals with an adverse food reaction also have reactions to um, environmental allergens, so they are also atopic, and the, the the adverse food reaction is just one of a number of environmental allergens that may be causing a problem. So it's important to kind of maybe not pigeonhole these diseases uh, separately, but realize how they overlap, and that managing diet, managing fleas, as well as using immuno immunotherapy, is important in the management of atopic dogs. Uh, when do I think it's best to use uh, immunotherapy? Um, early on. Okay, I'll go back here. When I see these dogs walk into my clinic, my heart sinks. These dogs will have had disease for several months, if not several years. 
um, and they are going to be difficult to get under control and the prognosis is going to be worse. They're going to require a lot more expensive and aggressive anti-inflammatory treatment. Um, whereas if I can see this dog, which is relatively early on uh, in its disease process, where it is largely just erythematous uh, and itchy, then the results are much better because there are, there are fewer other problems to get in the way and keep the disease, um, keep the disease going. And our experience, and this has been fairly widely published now, you should expect um, about three quarters um, of the dogs um, that present um, with, with relatively early stage disease to have at least a 50% improvement following immunotherapy. And that's not a bad outcome for what is a cost effective and pretty safe form of treatment. Chronic inflammatory conditions, in my experience, do worsen the prognosis. Um, and when I was a resident, I did a retrospective of our data from Edinburgh. And roughly speaking, it, um, in our data, dogs that had had disease for more than five years um, at presentation did statistically worse than dogs that had had disease for less than five years. And that's not quite been borne out by other studies that other people have published who haven't necessarily shown an association between age and duration of the, of the disease. So it might be that you have you have to look at the chronic inflammatory changes but if you can get the diagnosis and get the immunotherapy going before those start you'll get much better results. Um, what I get a lot of questions and advice calls about concurrent therapy and um, I think practitioners are often worried that concurrent therapy will interfere or uh, harm the, the uh, response to immunotherapy in some way. But it is unrealistic in most dogs that you will, you will not have to use concurrent therapy. There are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, as I've said, this is a disease of the skin barrier, uh, of an allergy and of the immune system. So we do need to target the, these, er these other areas as well. Um, it is, is, it, it is a, a treatment that requires um, several months to work. Certainly with our protocols, we don't really expect to see a response before three months and many dogs take six to nine and in some cases 12 months to show a reaction, uh, sorry, response to the immunotherapy. So they will need treatment to keep them comfortable in, uh, uh, in, in the meantime. Now skin barrier care, so essential fatty acids, shampoos, um, topical supplements such as alloderm, essential fatty acid enriched diets and so on are very unlikely to affect the, the response to immunotherapy. So I think those can be used um, without worrying about it. Uh, likely um, topical or systemic antimicrobial therapy. Um, the balance, the, the interaction between microorganisms and the immune system is really fascinating and complex, but it's, it is unlikely that that will uh, affect the response to immunotherapy. Uh, of more concern uh, is uh, what we do with cyclosporin and, and glucocorticoids, because obviously these have quite a profound impact on the um, uh, systemic and skin uh, immune systems. By preference now, we prefer to use topical glucocorticoids, and in particular hydrocortisone acipinate, which is cortivance, because of its local action, um, it is least likely to affect the response to immunotherapy. Um, however, there are some dogs where we have to resort to using systemic glucocorticoids or systemic cyclosporin. Um, uh, to keep to make them comfortable and give them a, a good or reasonable quality of life whilst we're waiting to see if the immunotherapy works. Now at the moment I can say that there is no evidence that using cyclosporin or systemic glucocorticoid affects the response to immunotherapy. Uh, however, th there's been no comparison to animals that have just been given immunotherapy without these other drugs as well. So whether or not they do, but I think at the moment, the best evidence is uh, treat on an as-need basis, but you often have to do something to keep the dogs comfortable. Um, but in the long term, obviously, with, with um, skin barrier care and uh, immunotherapy, what we will be doing is trying to re reduce or eliminate the reliance on um, especially systemic 
and anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, I said uh, immunotherapy was a, a very safe form of treatment, and it is. Um, we see very, very few um, side effects from this. Um, the only side effects that we see uh, um, with any uh, frequency is the increase in um, pruritus after the injection, which is usually a dose-related effect and can be managed, managed quite easily. Um, you can see nodules at the injection site. Um, in my experience using the aqueous vaccines, that is, is, is very uncommon. Um, and I've spoken to colleagues with the alum vaccines as well, and that's uncommon in, in their experience too. Um, the one side effect that we really worry about is um, uh, an anaphylactic reaction, because if you administer an allergen to an allergic animal, you've always got the potential to induce an anaphylactic uh, um, reaction. Um, we see very few, so we're up to about 10 now. Um, but I've been doing dermatology more or less full time for about 15 years or so. So, you know, in terms of the total number of cases I've seen, 10 is, is, is not very high. This was one case that was being treated through our own um, first opinion clinic uh, in Liverpool. And uh, this dog developed, um, technically it wasn't an anaphylactic reaction, it developed angioedema following its immunotherapy and you can see the, the periocular swelling here, swelling of the, uh, um, the muzzle as well. Now, coincidentally, um, whilst I was preparing to give this uh, webinar, I had a very panicked phone call from an owner um, with an animal, uh, with a dog that uh, had developed um, angioedema um, this afternoon after one of its early immunotherapy injections. And um, fortunately, uh, and that's me touching wood, um, I rang the owner back and um, the, the dog's, dog's fine, it's doing well and its, it's reaction's slowing down. So I was just doing that while you were all filing into the, the immunotherapy room. So these reactions do occur. In our experience, where they occur is early on in treatment. So um, w whatever protocol's being used, um, at least the first um, six, five or six injections are given under a veterinarian supervision and the dog uh, or cat waits for at least half an hour uh, on the premises before going home. And that is because if you if if they have one of these adverse reactions, they can you can intervene straight away. Now the, the um, dog number 10, the lady I was just talking to on the phone, is one of our unusual reactions because that is into the phase where the owner was treating at home. And what we then, what, but as a precaution, what we say to owners is give the injection during the day when, you, when a vet, your vet is open so that if something happens, you can go straight down. You're not having to find whoever the emergency vet is and travel across to the other side of town, something like that. So, sorry, having banged on about angioedema and anaphylactic reactions, uh, it is uncommon. Um, it's something we warn owners about, but we do reassure them it's, it, it's an uncommon reaction. Now, monitoring uh, is really, really important. Now, we do, we do a rush um, uh, protocol. Actually, rush sounds a bit careless. I need to think of a better word for that. But we do, we do a rush protocol, uh, which I'll go uh, through a little bit later on for you. Um, but whether you do your induction uh, period over uh, uh, three months or in one day, um, most owners after that can then generally treat their animals at home. Um, you know, one of the big secrets that we keep in, in veterinary practice is how difficult subcutaneous injections can be. But there are plenty of owners who can do this. They're used to treating diabetic animals. Um, they may be used to treating themselves with insulin or, or, or whatever. And it is often more convenient for them to do this. But the big thing is don't let them um, do this for months on end without seeing the animal or without having some sort of phone call um, uh, or follow-up because you need to ensure that the compliance uh, is correct. Uh, is the dog actually getting the injections when you think it is? And bear in mind that only about a third of um, courses of treatment that are given out by vets are actually administered as the vet intended. And one of the big keys to compliance is regular contact, keeping the client on board, uh, discussing treatment with them, 
asking them if they're having any problems or challenges, things like that, and just reminding of the importance to stick to the doses and frequency. I said earlier that you may need to adjust the frequency or the dose depending on the, the, the animal's response, and it's only by talking to the owners that, that, you, will, you, that you will get to know that. Um, you also need to keep an eye out for flare factors, so for example, um, uh, heat, humidity. We tend to see two flares in RA topics, um, one in the summer and maybe July when we start to get some warm, humid weather, and then the second round about this time of year, so late October, early November, when it starts to get cold, people put the central heating on. Central heating dries the atmosphere out indoors, so you get a, a, a dry, you sudden change to a warmer, dry uh, environment and that can affect dogs and cause things. Flea control is really important. If the if atopic dogs get exposed to fleas, it's going to worsen their disease. Another big factor with us, and this can be um, local, uh, are harvest mites. So these are the neotrombicular mites known as chiggers elsewhere in the world. With us, as a very seasonal distribution. It is late summer uh, and autumn. As um, soon as the first frosts have come, they're gone. In warmer parts of the world, this may be an all-year-round problem, but they tend to affect the ears, the face, the underside of the body, and the interdigital skin, which coincidentally are all the sites of the body affected by immunotherapy. Uh, secondary infections might need to be controlled and treated and things like this. So it's important to realize that, that the immunotherapy um, uh, flare factors may also need managing from time to time to maintain the uh, uh, the, the um, response to the immunotherapy and obviously it's very important to uh, monitor out for adverse effects as well. Um, now the I said earlier we under under the sort of standard leisurely uh, every few days or uh, weekly protocols you're unlikely to see a response to immunotherapy for about three months. Uh, most dogs seem to start to respond between three and six months, um, but some may um, may take longer than that. Um, with animals that have seasonal disease or seasonal exacerbations, it is quite important to do a full 12-month follow-up um, because what you want to do is see that you're able to blunt the response to the pollens or other seasonal allergens when the animal is exposed to them, but you may have to wait right through the winter and into the following spring to actually show that. Um, our bench. Th this is this is our benchmark for success, and I will appreciate that this may opinions may differ on this. But what we're looking for is at least a 50% reduction in clinical signs. So this is uh, th these are the sort of clinical lesions or pruritus, and or at least a 50% reduction. Uh, in anti-inflammatory treatment requirements. Either or both of those for us is a, is, is a good outcome. Now one of the problems is, 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 is in judging this and it is really important to make sure that the pruritus levels, clinical signs and doses are accurately recorded at the beginning, uh, during follow-up and at the end of therapy so you can make an evidence-based judgment on really how effective treatment has been in an individual animal because if the immunotherapy is not working um, you, you know, give up, move on to something, you know, spend the time and resources on something that's going to be um, more effective for that animal. Uh, we find that uh, encouraging owners to keep a diary of how pruritic their, their animals are, using the Cadesi or something similar for as, as a lesion score and so on can be very useful. But um, these, these follow-ups are very important. And as a minimum, uh, we like to see our animals one month after um, starting immunotherapy and then every three months through to 12 months and then if they're doing well and the owner's pretty confident we'll start to stretch the interval between uh, revisits out but we'll fill those in with a nurse phoning the owner or encouraging the owner to email us with a regular update so we can keep an eye on what's happening and intervene if needs be. Now this is the RUSH protocol that, that we use that's been published a, a couple of times now in, in small numbers of cases. Um, we don't actually pre-medicate with antihistamine anymore given that we've never yet seen um, uh, an anaphylactic reaction. But we hospitalize uh, the dogs and cats. We put a catheter in 
uh, again on a just-in-case basis in case I absolutely need immediate access to the to the venous system and then we administer the immunotherapy vaccine every 30 minutes by subcutaneous injection and what we try and do is get the owner to come in and administer at least the last injection with us so they can have a practice using needles and bottles and drawing solutions up and giving injections um, and then they go off and um, uh, uh, treat at home. Now the advantage is uh, our old leisurely induction protocol with once a week injections used to take about three months. And again if you're giving the injections starting daily to every other day um, uh, that can be a little bit quicker um, but the, there's no evidence that these rush protocols are any more effective in the long term um, but the response is definitely quicker which is why we've begun to uh, begun to prefer this and there's a little bit of data that it's well tolerated in four cats um, and we've treated a number of cats now and again they've tolerated the treatment okay at the moment but it's a little bit early to say whether um, what their response is um, other uh, people have looked at using uh, low dose immunotherapy which is where you dilute the immunotherapy vaccine out to at least one in ten uh, of what it should be and uh, the there was one ever one study really early on that seemed to show that this was uh, if anything more effective than standard immunotherapy um, and with quite considerable cost saving however a, a more recent study done at Edinburgh um, didn't show that there was any difference uh, in the response rates and in fact the response rate was lower um, than uh, the clinic was normally seeing so there was no there's, at the moment there's insufficient evidence to recommend low dose protocols the only um, thing I would say here is we with our protocol we start with um, uh, I, I want to go into too many details about protocols because you you will be using the protocol that your dermatologist or your lab sends you but the way we start is with a dilute vial at 2000 protein nitrogen units or PNU per mil and then we move up to a full dose vial uh, of 20,000 um, so what we do is when we get to giving one mil of the 2000 PNU per mil the next uh, injection is 0.1 of the 20,000 so we're just going up the dose very occasionally we see animals that become pyritic after the uh, low dose injections of that first vial and what we do there is we then take that vial and dilute it out to 200 PNU per mil and then start working through our protocol but that's so uncommon that we don't do it as a routine because again it just wastes time in in the immunotherapy program for most dogs so if 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 react if reactions to very low doses of immunotherapy are a problem in an individual dog that you're seeing it is worth talking to your dermatologist or uh, the lab who's supplying your vaccine to talk about diluting the vaccine but we wouldn't do that as a routine um, there are other routes for immunotherapy that are becoming more popular now and one that's very popular in people is um, what's called sublingual immunotherapy where you hold the uh, vaccine solution under your tongue and let it be absorbed across the oral mu mucosa um, people really like that because it avoids injections the difficulty in dogs is they will try to spit it out or swallow it because they don't understand it has to be held to be absorbed across the oral mucosa because it doesn't appear to work if it's actually ingested and um, Rosanna Marcella at Florida did try this um, in some beagles in her atopic colony and in this initial work it did seem to uh, be well tolerated in that it didn't cause any adverse reactions but they didn't see a clinical response to them so um, it's 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 probably more work and some way of retaining the vaccine in the oral mucosa is probably required here um, but there are some companies in America now um, providing uh, um, vaccine uh, uh, oral vaccines that can be used for sublingual immunotherapy and in dogs um, and it'd be interesting to see what the results the results from that are but they're not available in the UK and I don't have any experience of using them 
uh, Ralph Muller presented um, a, 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 an abstract at uh, an ESVD meeting quite uh, last year showing that intralymphatic immunotherapy um, was uh, was very well tolerated and in in an initial number of dogs the response seemed to be quicker and better than he would expect through traditional subcutaneous immunotherapy and they were injecting the vaccine into the submandibular lymph nodes under ultrasound guidance which I thought would be really really hard and he actually assured me was very very straightforward and the dogs tolerated it very well so it would be interesting to see what the um, uh, full papers for for these different routes come out because they might offer alternatives to the traditional subcutaneous route. Um, a bit of interest uh, just to finish up in using um, immunostimulating adjuvants to try and improve the response to immunotherapy. Um, bacterial DNA sequences are used quite routinely in humans now and there's a little bit of evidence that they do skew towards a T helper 1 response in dogs Although, as I said earlier, it's not so much the T-helper resp response as the toler tolerance response, which is important. Um, and then a listeria e extract has been used in experimentally in Japan as well. And using, um, sorry, using uh, the, these uh, immunomodulating adjuvants, subunit vaccines, specific allergenic proteins, and so on, maybe where we're going with immunotherapy in the future as opposed to just using our crude protein mixtures. A lot of what I've said already has been based around treating uh, cat, uh, sorry, dogs and this is because that's the species where, where most is known. Um, one of the problems with cats is we still really don't understand what the clinical phenotype of the allergic cat is. Um, and how we make that diagnosis and what the relevance of allergy tests is. But I think if you have a cat that is pyritic uh, and or displaying one of the classic eosinophilic reaction patterns, so eosinophilic plaque, granuloma, head and neck dermatitis, symmetrical alopecia, miliary dermatitis and so on, and you've ruled out other causes, most importantly fleas, food where you can, um, environmental factors, psychological factors and so on. There are some cats that have positive tests to um, skin testing and serology and the Avacta test is so far the only one that I'm aware of where a significantly greater proportion of cats with presumed allergic skin disease were positive to D-Farinae extracts compared to cats without skin disease. Um, a similar proportion of those cats appear to respond to immunotherapy as we would expect in dogs and we're pretty much using small dog protocols and there haven't really been any well controlled or blinded studies to support this but it, it, it seems to be um, uh, that in those cats immunotherapy can be a valuable well tolerated and often effective form of treatment and it can be very useful in some allergic cats where administering oral drugs can be very, very difficult and very, very challenging for an owner. Um, but we've got a few cats, for, um, for example, where the owners cannot give oral medication, but they can actually inject their cat at home. That doesn't seem to be an issue. But I think we do need further work on the clinical definition and diagnostic criteria for allergic cats. Um, we need better tests and we need some um, better evidence for the use of allergen specific immunotherapy. Um, when we test is somewhat controversial. Um, ideally with an allergic animal you should have a situation where the animal has been exposed to all the allergens that are likely to cause a problem and it's got a fully mature immune system because we certainly we know that dogs up to about three months of age are unable to respond either have a serological a positive serological test or unable to respond to um, intradermal testing and in animals less than 12 months of age they may not yet have been exposed to the full um, panoply of environmental allergens that they're going to come across so we may be missing 
uh, pollen allergies, for for example. Um, we we do test animals under 12 months of between 6 and 12 months uh, of age, um, but with the caveat to the owners that if they don't respond to the immunotherapy or they subsequently worsen, we may have missed something and we will retest them. It can also be worth retesting animals that move to a different location. So, for example, um, dogs which are pollen allergic that move to uh, a, a very different environmental niche. So, for example, from northern Europe to the Mediterranean, um, from Canada to the southern US, uh, perhaps, um, and, and exposed to a different range of pollens. And if their immunotherapy uh, or the skin disease worsens or immunotherapy is relapsing, then it is worth uh, retesting them as well. Certainly if their seasonal pattern of disease changes, so if they go from seasonal to perennial or from perennial to having a seasonal exacerbation, um, it is retesting them. And if you can identify new allergens, um, it is worth uh, reformulating the immunotherapy vaccine um, because that can be beneficial in some dogs. So, uh, in conclusion, um, we use immunotherapy in uh, horses, dogs and cats, mainly with skin disease, occasionally with respiratory disease. Um, it is a safe, effective and affordable treatment, but it is not an easy treatment necessarily for the veterinarian to work with. It has to be specific, it takes time, um, a complete cure is unlikely, it has to be integrated into treatment protocol and you need to monitor these cases carefully. And when I did my retrospective in Edinburgh those years ago, the single biggest factor on outcome was the veterinarian's experience of using immunotherapy. And this is where I go back to what I said right at the beginning, rather than worrying about whether one protocol is better than another, get used to the protocol that you're doing, what you, the nuances of treatment, what you expect to see and how to adjust treatment to get the best response. And if you're new to using immunotherapy, there is a learning curve. Um, and don't be embarrassed uh, or afraid to ask your laboratory for support or your referral dermatologist for support. Um, your laboratory certainly should have a dermatologist who they can put you in touch with to discuss problems that you're having or any questions that you have and if they can't then it's time to think about changing laboratory. Um, so I hope that was useful um, and I hope that it encourages uh, you to either start using immunotherapy if you've not um, or, or keep going uh, uh, and maybe me, be more confident in Thank you, Tim. Um, on behalf of Webinar Club, I'd like to thank you for an incredibly informative webinar. Um, we do have some questions for you, so we will try and get through as many as we can. Um, the first one I have, which is, is one that quite a lot of people are asking, um, is skin testing better than blood allergy testing? Uh, and Do the results match? <laughs> well, it depends on your definition of better. Um, I... I prefer skin testing, um, partly because I, with skin testing, you're actually testing the skin's capacity to respond to the allergens. You're actually testing the presence of allergen-specific IgE on mast cells in the skin. Now, there is a big jump between saying that they're present and they're causing the skin disease, but it's a lesser jump than saying you have IgE circulating in the bloodstream. Having said that, there is an assumption that skin testing is the gold standard to which serology is compared to, and that may not necessarily be true. And there is a little bit of evidence to say that serology is um, more sensitive when it comes to pollens and uh, than skin testing is, and serology appears to be less affected by concurrent treatment than skin testing is. So skin tests are obliterated by recent antihistamine or um, steroid therapy, and that's less of a problem with, with serology. Um, the other reality is that the... Uh, so the other thing for house dust mites and, and possibly other allergens as well, skin testing seems to be more sensitive 
Uh, no more specific. Um, I, I, I must get around to publishing this one day, but I did some work where we compared a large number of dogs with um, the Alicept. This is the this is the um, the Hesca recombinant IgE receptor molecule serology test and intradermal testing. And the serology was no less specific, but it was a little bit less sensitive. So roughly speaking, somewhat more than a third, between a third and a half of the dogs negative on the Alicept test were positive on the uh, intradermal testing. And there were some differences in individual allergens that the animals were reacting to on the two tests, but these were not, um, the, the, these were not consistent. So I think my preference would still be for intradermal testing. The reality, however, is that it is expensive and time consuming to maintain an intradermal test kit. And if you're not intradermal testing very frequently, uh, which I guess most people in first opinion practice will be in that situation, it is probably better to use um, serology. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, do you feel that once started on allergen-specific immunotherapy, dogs should stay on it lifelong, uh, or do you aim to get patients off injections? That's a good question, because I actually forgot to mention it in the presentation. Um, the, 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 the aim would be to get the animal off immunotherapy. The reality is that only happens in a small minority. So the majority of animals do require lifelong therapy um, uh, with the immunotherapy injections. And what we're aiming for is the lowest dose and or frequency that keeps their clinical signs under control, albeit that may vary uh, uh, over the year. So, so that's, what, that's what we're aiming for. The majority do require lifelong therapy and do have to be kept on it. But if the dog is very well controlled or the cat's very well controlled, you can just keep extending the interval between injections and eventually in some of them you'll wean them off. Most of them you'll find the break point though. Uh, someone wants to know, can we use antihistamine meds during immunotherapy? Uh, yes, anti antihistamines are very unlikely to interfere with immunotherapy. They're probably the least effective some of the least effective drugs that we uh, use to control skin disease simply because there's often much more going on in the, in the skin um, than uh, than just histamine. You take the histamine out, the skin can inflame itself through a variety of other other mechanisms. Cynic, well, actually, not cynically. Um, we actually prefer the sedating antihistamines. We use chlorpheniramine and hydroxyzine a lot. Um, because uh, Neil McEwen and I did a small study a few years ago, and this was backed up by another study John Plant did in the States, and we showed that um, atopic dogs are, are quite significantly disturbed by their paritis overnight, and this leads to quite marked sleep deprivation compared to healthy dogs, and we know from humans that that is a big, has a massive impact on quality of life, and sometimes using a sedating antihistamine particularly last thing at night, can just give the dogs uh, a good night's sleep and they're so much better um, during the day for that. Um, but certainly you can integrate that in as an antipyritic treatment. Okay, um, next question. How many injections do you give in hospital during rush immunotherapy? Um, <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> Uh, it, it's ten or twelve. I, I can't remember. It, we usually we, we aim to we aim to start at somewhere between nine and ten in the morning, and we do it about every half hour. And the dogs usually go home about three thirty to four o'clock. Okay. Um, and also about the rush protocols, how much faster response do you see uh, with them compared to traditional immunotherapy? Um, on average, it, it it's between one to three months quicker. Okay, um, somebody else wants to know, do some breeds react better to immunotherapy than others? That is a really interesting question because uh, anecdotally I would say, well anecdotally I would have said yes, but um, I keep getting students to go through my data and they show that actually no. So the other good lesson there is when it comes to recollection we're all flawed. But 
other people have mentioned this. Um, I don't think in, in the papers there have been any consistent findings in terms of breed, but it's something we might look at in the future because the, the genotype of an, and clinical phenotype of atopic dermatitis varies between individuals and certainly varies between breeds. And this may reflect that um, skin barrier function, for example, is a major component of the disease in some individuals, whereas the allergy is a minor component component of the disease. Um, and in the future, and I'll emphasize in the future, we may look at this in terms of predicting which dogs are like more or less likely to, to work, respond well to immunotherapy. We can't do it at the moment, and therefore I wouldn't use breed or, or clinical phenotype as a uh, to put me off using immunotherapy, but I definitely think there's something going on there. Okay, um, another question. Um, when using topical steroids, at which point would we need to wean dogs off this uh, to assess the efficacy of allergen-specific immunotherapy? Um, it depends a bit on the protocol you're using, but roughly speaking, you're not going to see much response for about three months. So what I would do in that first three months is, is, is aim to get the dog uh, the dog's clinical lesions under control and get the dog comfortable. So if I just run back through the slides, oh, there we go, to these two, you know, what you should be doing in the first three months, lost my arrow, uh, what you should be doing in the first three months is really getting these dogs under control. So this chronic skin disease, the chronic ear disease, their infections, um, should be being managed through topical treatments, um, steroids, cyclosporin, um, topical ear medication, antimicrobials, and so on. Um, because what you're trying to do is get those dogs back to uh, a, a kind of um, standard like this, where you're dealing as much as possible with um, the skin barrier and the allergy, and you've minimized the chronic inflammation. Um, and then once you've got the animal to like this, what you can keep doing is just keep trying to push that immunotherapy, sorry, push that topical or systemic glucocorticoid therapy down or, or cyclosporin. So, you know, keep trying to push the dose down, keep trying to push the frequency down, keep trying to swap from systemic therapy to topical therapy. And this is kind of where the black art of immunotherapy comes in because there's no fixed protocol for doing that. You've got to see the animals, you've got to talk to the owners, you've got to explain things, and every protocol is going to be slightly different. Um, but if, if going from that sort of three-month point to the six or nine-month point, we can get at least a 50% reduction in the, in the um, uh, anti-inflammatory requirements, um, then you know it is probably worth continuing with. Now, you have to be a bit careful at the beginning because obviously if you're using really aggressive immunotherapy sorry aggressive anti-inflammatory treatment to control these dogs for the first three months you are going to reduce you know after the first month two months three months you are going to be able to reduce the um the anti-inflammatory requirements simply because you just don't need to treat them as aggressively anymore so it's really in that sort of second half of the immunotherapy protocol is can you make a substantial difference in the anti-inflammatory requirements of the dog once you've kind of got it down to its baseline state. So be a bit wary about um, ascribe being too quick to ascribe early drops in aggressive anti-inflammatory treatment to the immunotherapy because it might just be that you've actually got your skin disease under control and you're weaning off treatment anyway. Okay, uh, just uh, time for a, a couple more questions. Um, is the extent of positivity of the serology result something that needs to be taken into consideration or do we just need to look at it whether it's positive or negative? Uh, you look at it if it's positive or negative. There's no evidence that the, uh, that the teeter or the, um, the, 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 the wheel size has any relation to severity or response to immunotherapy. So you look at the cutoffs. Okay. Um, would you try to fix um, the animal's condition with other therapies before starting ASIT? Uh, does that improve the outcome? Um, not that I'm aware of. 
and we try and start the immunotherapy relatively early on simply because um, you're saving time. You certainly wouldn't um, lose anything in terms of efficacy by waiting to start the immunotherapy but you may lose time so we don't tend to do that. Okay and uh, I think just just time for, for one last question. Um, do you see much efficacy with uh, immunotherapy in atopic cases with more focal presentation uh, for example otitis externa? Um, no provided the the inflammatory component of the otitis is controlled. So again, if you have an active, um, again, I'll go back to my favorite two cases. So you, if you look at both of these dogs, they've got, sorry, I'll get the right arrow. If you look at both of these dogs, um, they've got you know quite severe chronic otitis with a lot of lichenification, thickening, probably secondary infection within those ear canals. If you treat those ear canals within, with immunotherapy, they're not going to get better. But if you get those ear canals, if you control the infection, you control the inflammation, you get them back down to a normal anatomy, the immunotherapy can then be useful in controlling flares of inflammation in the long term um, associated with uh, exposure to the allergen and preventing the otitis coming back again, but they're not a therapy for actual ongoing otitis. Okay, well, I think that's um, uh, that's all the questions that we've got time for. Um, so thank you very much once again, Tim. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to our sponsors for this evening, Avact Animal Health and ALK. Um, the recording and the certificate for this webinar will be available later this week. Uh, we will email everybody as soon as they're ready. Thank you very much all for attending. That's the end of the webinar.